we had been involved way back in the early 90s with the early days of VR. It was early on the technology side, but it was also one of those things where you had this huge crowd of people that were very enthusiastic, very sure about all the social change of VR, but right. they just didn't have hardcore technical people. And most of the people that could have done that went into games right. in a lot of ways. So I had kept a little bit of an eye on it, and some people had told me that there were better consumer level things available. And so I finally just went and bought myself something. You know, I found one of the cottage industry integrators that had a head tracker and a, a VR headset okay. on there. And I got it, and it sucked. It was still just as bad as I had remembered it from all the different versions that I had tried. And uh, So have you tried, uh, like at any trade shows, tried head mount displays? There's a thing in a dome in Quake Yeah, on. that's the laser projector guy. Yeah, but that wasn't on my head, right? That was just projecting against the yeah. wall. Right, yeah. But so it's uh, this is best when I get somebody that's tried these over the last two decades and okay. see this because very much what I've got here is what people always imagined it was like, and it wasn't. Got it. I, got it. But so I took this, I, you know, I got this head mount, and it's no good. But then I take it apart both literally and figuratively. I, I find out why it's no good, what the whole chain of events is on there. And one of the interesting things about VR is it is this long chain. You've got sensors and communications and simulation and rendering, output and display and optics. And we've got the middle part of that in games in many ways, but it adds some extra pieces onto the other ends there. And like any chain, it's only as strong as the weakest link. If you do a bad job on any part of it, then it's not going to come out the experience you want. So I went through, I analyzed all of this, found out like on the sensor side of things, uh, they had software library you could link to that would give you an orientation on there and it had a hundred milliseconds of latency it's just you know you look over this way and the world catches up to you so I, I thought well why is this that bad I I took raw sensor data from it instead of their uh, their orientation uh, result from it and I took the integration code that I used at Armadillo Aerospace with our fiber optic gyros for our rockets pull that over integrate it all of a sudden that's much better then I go one step further, I contact Hillcrest Labs was the company that made the little sensor there. I, I send them an email, it's one of those days where it's good to be me, they knew who I was and yes. they said, oh, this is, this is cool. And they actually made a custom firmware for me that doubled the update rate going from 125 to 250. This is one of those things, it didn't cost anything, it was just a little software development. They didn't know anybody needed something like that. Right. So already I've gone and I've, you know, I've lopped like 85 milliseconds out of this whole loop on there by do the integration right, you know, don't filter it, don't over filter it, get the higher update rate on there. I do the stuff that I know how to do well about making sure that you don't let the GPU driver buffer an extra frame because left to themselves, the GPU will buffer a frame or two so they can maximize their benchmark scores on there, but right. you actually have to stick in fences and say, no, stop here, I mean it, then okay. I'm going to read sensor data. Okay. And I can do some things like, I. One of the tricks I always wanted to try was, traditionally in gaming, you read a sensor, you do your simulation, then you do your rendering on there. Okay. In modern games on consoles and multiprocessors, you overlap those two. So one, you're rendering frame in while you're simulating frame in plus one. Uh, but when you really, really care about latency, you can say, I fetched my new head tracker orientation, I'm passing it on to the game code, but I'm gonna go ahead and forward this to the renderer. And even though I haven't updated the simulation of the world, I'll let it go ahead and change the projection matrices just at the very last moment to okay. save another 16 milliseconds of latency on there. So I go and I pull all of this stuff out on there, yeah. and then I'm left with, all right, from motion to coming out of the computer, it's really, really efficient. But then it goes over a video cable into a display, and the whole industry has these horrible problems with display vendors introducing unnecessary latency on them. And like the, the Sony head mount display, which is an excellent value, it's like $800 on here. It's not a, a VR helmet, it's a 3D TV on your head. Okay. But the, the problem with that is that it's got consumerish firmware in there where you do resolution conversion if you want it there's 720p displays but if you want to support 1080p you have to resample there it supports side by side top bottom frame pack 3d supports hdmi content protection on there and in an ideal world all of this gets implemented as this tiny little queued buffer on there but what happens in reality unfortunately is you have one team that goes and does conversion, one team that does resampling, one team that does copy protection, right. and there's a buffer between each of these. So you've got 50 milliseconds that goes, by the time it comes out of the back of the computer, to the time photons come off the display there. And I, I made this, this uh, analogy that 
is uh, that really drives it home where you can send a packet from the United States to Europe in less time than it takes to get a pixel out of the back of your computer into your display. That's ridiculous. And the only reason it's like that is because router and switch people know that latency is important. They give a damn about it and they've done a good job with it. But I display people aren't yet. And I'm evangelizing that a lot right now where, you know, the last decade it took me all that time evangelizing virtualization, virtual right. memory on GPUs. I can finally get off of that one because that's mostly right. here finally. Now it's display vendors fix your latency pipelines. So this is it? So this, on is, this. So this is the product so, of all this. So what happened on this is I'm building, I've got like five different head mounts at my office I, back there. And I was pursuing lots of different axes of improvements. Low latency is one of them, wide field of view is another one, absolute positioning is another one. But I was building these things myself, and then I came across uh, this guy, Palmer Lucky, that had, he's got a huge personal collection of head mount displays, and he's been building this in his workshop. He's offering, going to be offering this as a kit for only $500 for the optics. Okay. He just sent it to me, the, the optics. I added my sensors and the strap and the software and stuff on here. What's interesting about this is, Traditionally, like if you look at expensive head mount displays that offer wild field of views, they've got uh, huge optics traits, very complicated and heavy and expensive stuff on there that is sophisticated and cool, but it's never going to be really cheap on there. Uh, a simple set of optics like he's got in here, there's a pair of lenses uh, that are fixed onto a six inch display. It's kind of like a mini tablet, maxi cell phone sort of display back there, split in half with the optics focusing on there. And if you just looked at a normal image on there, it comes out massively fisheye distorted because that's just the trade-offs in optics. If you just do a simple thing, it bends it around your yeah, view. Yeah. But nowadays, we have all this GPU power coming out our ears. So I do a software pre-correction for all of that. I map what the distortion is on this, and then I invert the map on the software side. And then when you look at it here, it comes out just wrapping around the whole world for you. Okay. So I beyond that. that, yeah, let me go ahead and so the great thing about this, this was my hobby project on this that I was tinkering around with. When we decided to reissue Doom 3, the thought was, how do you do something to make people interested in an eight-year-old title? You know, it was a great right. eight-year-old title, but it's old. To the armor. Uh, yeah, on. so put, we put did, yes, I know we you got did. that on there. That was good. But I, the idea was, well, I've got all this stereoscopic stuff that I'm yeah. doing. Microsoft and Sony really are... They're pushing the 3D TV stuff, which I'm still not a huge backer of. I think I did as good of a job as possible with it, and it's kind of neat, but it's it's a toss-up about whether you'd want to play that, especially yeah. on a console where you have to trade some frame right. rate for it. On a high-end PC, you could blast it at high res on this. Now, I'm gonna, before I put it on, yeah. I'm going to tell you, I don't know if I want to play games with a thing on my face. All right, so it is it cuts you off from the rest of the world. Yeah. And of the people, only maybe 30 people have tried this so far since okay. we started integrating right. gaming on it. There have been a few people that seem to have some focusing problems okay. with it. It is low res. At this point, it's kind of one eye of this. So it's a 1280 by 800 display. Each eye gets 640 by 800 on there, and yeah. it's stretched over an enormous field of view. So you can see pixels in there. But that's one of these things that's going up automatically. We've got higher end displays coming no matter what. So we'll set you up in this, I'll hand you the headphones, and then the game controller. Now, in the game-wise, you can adjust the aim up and down with this as well as with your head. So okay. you can aim, you can draw a bead on something just like you would in a console game on there, but you can also fine-tune it with your head. Okay. So, get this on, we can tighten the strap, or loosen the strap for you. Okay. So here's the head headphones. Headphones. We're going to another world. Oh, all right. Now. Oh wow, oh okay. Oh. Oh, oh I oh, forgot I to put you in god mode, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. It's alright. Oh, we can look at the person who Yeah, you're stuck now, what you did. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I like that though, I like that. Do you, do you want me to restart it with... Uh, no, 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 I'm good. Cause, longer. Cause, uh, but yeah, you get the sense yeah. of the, the experience there. So is, it, is the uh, trajectory for this, though, that you think that there's a, a more and more elegant, almost to the point where we're at the Google, Google Glasses stage at some point, where it's just sunglasses we put so, on? I think in the long term, augmented reality has more commercial potential, where there's there really is a possibility that five years from now, uh, augmented reality glasses will be as ubiquitous, at right. least as Bluetooth headsets on there. That's something that has really broad appeal. My heart's still more with the immersive holodeck virtual reality stuff. Which is more where, yeah. where you can go with and, this kind of thing. You know, it's important to realize that the uh, 
the concept video that Google has for the Google Glass is right. not what the current technical reality is. That's the vision of where they right. want to go. Right, right, right. And it's a good vision, and we'll eventually get there, but this is actually a lot closer. You know, this is stuff that can be available soon. <laughs> okay, so, so to wrap this up, if people want to have this experience, obviously if they want to have the Doom BFG Edition experience, they just need to get the game later this, this year, but what's the trajectory towards getting their hands on one of so these $500 I, I units? Support. 3D TVs, monitors, you can get the Sony head mount on here and you can right. buy the, the sensors about $100, the hit tracker right. on there. But this is at 45 degrees, this is not nearly as immersive. You know, have you, have you tried one of these on? Uh, I, I, I've not. But I've just not. as a quick comparison point. Yeah. So this isn't set up in tracking mode right now, but it has integrated headphones, which is kind of nice. But the optics are a lot more finicky. You have to get it in exactly the right spot. And that's I the feel difference. Like I'm miles away from the game, too. <laughs> But that's the difference between a 45 degree field of view and yeah. what you were seeing with a 90 degree. I don't know. It's, yeah, that's not, not the coolness that you get. <laughs> it's a 3D TV you can wear on your head that has no ghosting. That's yeah. the primary I'll thing. Just, I'll just put my face right up to my TV if I yeah. want that experience. No, this was, this was cool. It's this very was different. But, but so what we've got on this is, the hope is that I'm, so this is called the Oculus Rift, and Paul Merlucky is, he's gonna be starting a Kickstarter to fund the first batch of 100 kits or okay. so. And the hope is that they're gonna come out around $500 for the kit, uh, add a sensor and a copy of Doom 3, and you're probably $600 on there. I may wind up actually subsidizing some of this first batch because I think okay. it's so incredibly cool on uh, this. Uh, but I'm hoping that we'll have some of these available at QuakeCon timeframe in August because that's so the crowd that will get into yeah, this. Yeah. All the people that make totally case cool. mods and everything that to have a chance to have an impact on how really cutting edge VR stuff is gonna go because in many ways this is better than the really high end units. And all we need is 100 people making different cuts on how you adjust the optics, how you mount it to your head, how you integrate speakers with it, all of this stuff that, that really are workshop tasks that people can do and can make a difference here. I wanna see like 10 people or whatever in a death match, all with these on, all in the same room, all walking around. Well, trying where to this do is that. going to go in maybe a couple years is instead of being tethered to a PC, you build it off of mobile phone hardware, yeah. you know, uh, an iPhone 5 or whatever with optics on there, integrated with all this, so no temp, no wires, use the cameras for absolute optical position reckoning, and then you could literally walk around. Right you could go ahead and set up your paintball arena and skin it in virtual reality right. however you want. John Carmack, you're so. a smart man. <laughs> Thank Good you. Stuff.